Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to what we hope will be the first of many conversations about regionalism at the School of Cities, working in close collaboration with Dr. Enid Slack of IMFG. So I'm Karen Chapel. I'm the director of the School of Cities and professor of geography and planning at the University of Toronto. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge first that for thousands of years, this land upon which we convene tonight has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home for many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, or what we settlers call North America. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work here. I hope that our conversation tonight generates insights and thoughtful reflection on how we can be better stewards of this land in the spirit of the dish with one spoon wampum belt agreement, an agreement on how the land can be shared to the mutual benefit of all of its inhabitants. So you are about to have a great treat. You, you'll hear from our speakers today why a regional sensibility or a metropolitan mindset, as Mayor Don Iveson likes to call it, is so important. Mayor Iveson will lay out a roadmap towards regional governance. And Dr. Zach Taylor and Dr. Jen Nellis will point out the many obstacles along the way. But you might ask why the school cities? At the school, we create new ways for people to thrive in cities and regions that are just and sustainable. Good governance makes thriving possible. Canada is supposed to be a model of that, right? In fact, I remember when I was in grad school studying regionalism, and we used to point to Portland, the Twin Cities, and Toronto as the models. That feels like a long time ago. Toronto had an opportunity to strengthen its metropolitan regional governance. And there, there were lots of great ideas. Back in 1996, the Task Force on the Future of the Greater Toronto Area published a report. But Toronto went down the amalgamation path and the rest is history. Meanwhile, in the US, there are functional, I believe, regional governance structures that have powers like carrots and sticks to integrate land use and transportation, and to make municipalities build affordable housing. Canada has fallen behind. And at the School of Cities and IMFG, we're committed to finding a way to move forward. That's why we're all here tonight. So first, a little bit of housekeeping. Today's event is hybrid. That means we have a small audience here in the room and more people on Zoom. So welcome to everyone joining us online. Um, this also means that the Q&A following the panel will take place in person and on Zoom. If you're participating online, you can ask questions by typing them into the uh, Q&A on Zoom or the chat field. So the run of show tonight will be as follows. Um, Don, Mayor Don Iveson will speak to us first. Um, and then we have two uh, discussants, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Nellis in that order. Um, and that will be followed by the Q&A. So with that, I'll introduce our speakers. Don Iveson served as mayor of the city of Edmonton from 2013 to 2021 and chair of Canada's big city mayors from 2016 to 2021. We're delighted that he was appointed as the first Canadian urban leader at the School of Cities, a term which has been renewed this year for another year. Don worked to drive a metropolitan mindset in the regional land use and growth plans at the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Board and through the creation of Edmonton Global, the collaborative organization bringing together 14 municipalities to promote economic growth. 
Don also has served as an honorary witness to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Oh my good uh, stuff. Zach? Don't I? <laughs> okay, I'm going to introduce uh, Zach and Jen, and then we'll go to you, Don. Uh, Zach Taylor is Associate Professor of Political Science at Western University, where he teaches and researches on urban politics and local governance, with a particular focus on the governance of urban regions. He's a fellow at the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance and a non-practicing registered professional planner. His latest book is called Shaping the Metropolis on Metropolitan Governance in North America, published in 2019. And Dr. Jen Nellis is a senior research fellow with the Innovation Caucus and co-director of Oxford Regions Innovation and Enterprise Lab at Oxford Brooks Business School. She's also a visiting research professor with the Networks and Governance Lab at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Her latest book is called Discovering American Regionalism, um, 2019. And she also has a forthcoming book about the Port Authority. So welcome, Zach and Jen. And now we'll turn it over to Mayor Don Iveson. Thank you. Well, thanks, Karen. And uh, in, in Canada, we don't get to keep the titles. So I'm just Don. Uh, Is that right? That's true. Know. It's true. Now, uh, we had the slides and they all went by on my screen. I don't know if they, uh, if they did for others, but if we can get them back up. Maybe I'll, I'll just start with a couple of acknowledgements. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I'm not coming to you from uh, the, the treaty territory that, uh, that Karen acknowledged. I'm coming to you from Treaty 6 territory here out west, uh, the traditional territory of the Cree, the Dene, the Soto, the Nakota Sioux, and Blackfoot peoples in a territory sometimes called Edmonton, other times called Amiskwichi Waskahigan, which is the, the old Cree name for this place, which means Beaver Hills Lodge. Now, I really wish I could have been with you there in person, and I apologize if I start coughing, but uh, I came down with the flu over the weekend and uh, still not feeling the best. So after counseling people and even begging people to do the right thing from a public health standpoint, through most of the pandemic as mayor, I, I felt I didn't have much choice but to do this from remote. So I really appreciate uh, Monk and the School of Cities uh, pivoting to do this uh, virtually. And um, I'm sorry that I won't have the chance to sit with Dr. Taylor and Dr. Nellis, um, but I'm still very much looking forward to the conversation and to their unpacking of what I'm about to say, because at the end of the day, I'm a polemicist. I'm, I'm not an academic, um, <laughs> much to the disappointment of my uh, mother and father with the five degrees between the two of them. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking for applied uh, credit here uh, or, or equivalent experience points or something uh, from, from my time. But let's go to the first slide and let's just ground this very place-based discussion with some maps. Who doesn't like maps, right? Um, and Canada, let's start from this altitude, is the wider place that we're talking about. And let me begin by establishing a premise that stronger Canadian city regions is actually good for every single Canadian. You know, we hear the zero sum thinking that improving our cities will come at the expense of rural Canada. And that's really the first obstacle that we need to overcome in many quarters when we're thinking about this. Now, I managed to do that as chair of Canada's big city mayors while strengthening trust with rural members of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, partly because I understood from being mayor of Edmonton, that is sometimes referred to as a gateway to the north, that as goes northern Alberta, so goes Edmonton. But it's also equally true that as goes Edmonton, so goes northern Alberta. We were the hub and are the hub for healthcare, education, professional services, finance, innovation, concerts, sports, local tourism. And our extended trading area was the source of our food, our water, our energy, and much of our prosperity. And for every part of this country, some version of this is true. And the sooner we start acting like it, the better off every Canadian will be. But let's level set the discussion now with two reality checks. The first is the Government of Canada map on the left, demarking the five regions of Canada for economic development purposes. And the West was only recently demised into 
BC and the prairies. Now, this is not the kind of region I want to focus on, as there are several distinct metropolitan areas in each of these federal super regions. But I think that this is an overriding idea of regionalism in Canada, and one that has driven at least as much grievance as it has positive impact. So I want to talk about regions differently than the map on the left. Now, the second point I want to make with the map on the right, which may be a little tough to see, but is that this is a profoundly urbanized and profoundly asymmetrical country. 50% of Canadians live south of that little red line in the lower right. And even more uh, profoundly, 90% of Canadians live within a two hour drive of the US border. Uh, now try to tell someone from Yellowknife that we the North, right? Uh, most of this country is uh, still a fairly Southern place and concentrated and clustered along that border. Now, half of everybody else other than that 90% actually lives in the Edmonton metro region, the northernmost major city on the continent, over a million people. Now, I think if we spent as much time and effort building great cities as we do addressing the other tensions that pull this country to and fro, that it would have a profound positive impact, again, on the whole country. So let's go to the next slide for some obligatory sports content. Now, as a kid who grew up in Edmonton in the 80s, I love this map. But as a student of cities, of place, and of identity, I really love what it shows us about the North and about Confederation. Now, désolé si vous êtes un fan de les Nordiques. This is probably a mildly re-traumatizing map for some of you. But you can plainly see that TV markets, time zones, flight patterns, and service relationships between Vancouver and Yukon, Edmonton and NWT, and between Ottawa and Nunavut have formed bonds of real affinity. And while not everything in Canada reduces to hockey, the county level data here reveals that Oilers fans can be found, and this is no surprise to Edmontonians, but it might be to you, that they can be found in Northern BC, Northern Saskatchewan, in addition to Northwest Territories. And all of that really is that concept I mentioned earlier of Edmonton's extended trading area. Now, this probably isn't the best map, and I, I use this at some risk, um, uh, because it's not the best map to define what I really mean by the metropolitan units of Canada. But it makes the point that our provincial identities are actually pretty weak when it comes down to something truly important to Canadians like hockey. Now, a CFL map might work a little bit better if Mayor Savage can get the Halifax schooners up and running. And best of luck to him with that. Now let's go to the next slide. This map may be a little harder to decipher for you on the screen, but it's worth actually going and looking up. It's uh, federal parliamentary ridings all to a constant scale. And this is more or less a population adjusted map of our country with some outliers like PEI's four seats. But the diagonal stretch is really the Windsor to Quebec City corridor. And the bulge to the west is left to right, Vancouver Island, Greater Vancouver, Interior BC, Calgary with Edmonton and Northern Alberta, and the two whole territories jutting upward from there, then Saskatchewan, then Manitoba, which is mostly Winnipeg. And this is where most of us live. This is where we work. This is where we vote. This is where we create. This is where we play. And this is a network of metropolitan units that form this country, at least from a population standpoint. Now, I've been fascinated by maps like this ever since I saw a really similar one on the wall at Langevin Block in Ottawa. I was there for a meeting with Jerry Butts to talk about priorities for cities and the federal government, how we could work together. And that was after the 2015 election. And there were red tiles uh, on every metropolitan center, which is where they had won their majority and the ground that they needed to hold. Now, that electoral math is becoming more inevitable federally and in more and more provinces. If you get the metros right, you win. And as urbanization continues in an already overwhelmingly urban country, it'll be almost impossible to compellingly, much less effectively, lead the country as well as most provinces without having something to say about our cities. Next slide, please. Now, a quick word 
about provinces, the elephant in the room in all discussions about regionalism, in all Canadian uses of that term. Now, I like these maps from before Alberta and Saskatchewan were created in 1905, because they show something that many Albertans, including our premier, seem to have forgotten, which is that the very first made in, uh, made in Ottawa idea for Albertans was creating the thing in the first place by act of parliament, which is to say they are utter constructs, legal fictions at the end of the day. Now, I maintain that a country, on the other hand, which is, of course, also a human construct, is a, still a real going concern to the extent that it can maintain order, law, the integrity of its borders, in other words, peace, order, and good government. Now, I would also argue that a city region, too, is a going concern with hard infrastructure, tangible assets, integrated economies, flows of capital, human and financial. But at the end of the day, provinces are just lines on a map and they've changed in our lifetimes. They can be so much more, however, when they work as a form of regional government, which is actually partly what they were created to do, and especially if they were to do so constructively with their major metropolitan centers. Now, yes, under Section 92, municipalities and all things local are under their thumb, creatures of the provinces, we're often reminded. And I can report firsthand that it sometimes felt as if municipal governments were barely tolerated by provincial officials uh, on the level of a condominium board or a vexatious tourism authority, certainly not respected as active expressions of vibrant local democracy. But I'm not here to throw stones. Rather, I'm here to suggest that provinces need to adopt a metropolitan mindset. They do hold the strongest enabling tools for their local and metropolitan systems. The provinces uh, or, or province, but preferably more than one, that tune for these results with a metropolitan mindset should outperform those that don't. And I think we can see some evidence of this in British Columbia, which has a robust metropolitan set of institutions in the lower mainland and now on the island and increasingly in the interior. And likewise, in Nova Scotia, which is more and more driven by and dependent on a thriving amalgamated Halifax. Next slide, please. Now let's zoom all the way out. This is the real competition for our cities and for our country. Now we have a handful of small spikes on this map and we need to make them perform in this global context in terms of equity and well-being, affordability and competitiveness, climate and biosphere and raw economic outcomes. Now, are we confident of our position? I don't think we can be. On productivity, on investment, on affordability, we're struggling. So tuning our city regions with a metropolitan mindset can help us focus on the big picture. Now, I know easier said than done. So next slide, please. This is a very simple transect. Uh, of the complexity of just a few of the key systems that are at play in our complex metropolitan regions. Next slide, please. And these systems, of course, cross a bunch of jurisdictional boundaries. And in some parts of the country, City B or Town C might even be an Indigenous government's jurisdiction, which I actually think introduces some intriguing possibilities for innovation unconstrained by Section 92. More on that later. Next slide, please. Now, transects never tell the whole story. So the Amazon distribution center in the county out to the east there is killing the retail tax base of the center city while using the whole region's roads for free. The single family neighborhoods with the mountain views to the west have exclusionary zoning, which keeps prices up there. Oh, and the glacier is drying up at the headwaters of watershed A. The, the point is that these are all nested in interdependent systems, which don't all quite perfectly overlap, but which are all mutually dependent. Now, I really like the sustainability concept that not the old idea of the three-legged stool, but the concept that the economy is the wholly owned subsidiary of society and that society is the wholly owned subsidiary of the biosphere or nature. And you can't deplete either of the parent companies 
capital forever without replenishing or restoring it. Now that at the level of a city region, I think is the kind of systems thinking that we need for air sheds, for watersheds on the natural side of things, for housing markets and commuter sheds and labor markets on the social end of things, bridging into trade and the wider economy and the infrastructure systems that support that. So that's the kind of thinking we need to bring to each of our metro areas so that everybody who lives there and beyond in those interdependent uh, interstitial trading areas can thrive better. That's what I mean by a metropolitan mindset. Now, there is a fundamental premise in that, that it's a non-zero-sum proposition if we work together, and some may challenge that. But I still think it's better than the alternative. Next slide, please. So here's where the rubber hits the road. And I've thought about this quite a bit over the last year and, and probably years before, because we've been through a version of this in Alberta with the Edmonton Metro Region Board, formerly the Capital Region Board, and then watching what was happening in Calgary, watching what was happening in uh, Winnipeg, which was premised partly on what had unfolded in Edmonton. And so I admit a bias uh, from my own experience here. But I do think that there is a role for all orders of government uh, and for civil society to help incorporate this mindset, because it really is shared making of meaning in order to drive change. So there's convening from the bottom up and rallying together around quick wins. That's voluntary. That can happen today. That creates momentum. Um, and then there's the role of the provincial government. I mean, you can get a certain distance here with voluntary arrangements, but at the end of the day, the really serious work, including uh, statutory requirements for integrated land use and transportation planning, accountability mechanisms to those plans, uh, decision-making and financing schemes, requisition mechanisms, that ends up being at least regulatory, if not statutory, and unless all of that authority gets devolved to a city region in the first place by a province, a province is going to have to at least validate, if not make all those decisions. Now, ideally, that would be done in a collaborative way uh, with not just municipal governments, but other key stakeholders like airport authorities, post-secondary institutions. Um, and I don't just mean academics who have expertise. I mean the energy and infrastructure networks at post-secondary institutions that are cities within cities. And, and obviously um, uh, other stakeholders who will have views on all of this. Um, but that can't be a 10-year study. We've done enough of those. We need action uh, focus on driving improved outcomes, particularly around housing supply, emissions reduction, population health, productivity. We need to get beyond tinkering. And finally, someone's got to define a mandate uh, for all of those systems and put it into place. And again, this isn't going to get very far without provinces. But again, I argue it is in their interest to do this because it will improve outcomes all across the board. And I would like to see a time in the not too distant future where not doing this is seen as negligent on the part of a provincial government. Now, that's a culture change and a set of values and a momentum here that I'm hoping we can build out of this little talk and a paper that we're going to develop out of this over time to drive this kind of thinking across the country and build a consensus uh, that this is really the right path. Now, if we can go to the next slide. There is a role for the federal government too, uh, within its jurisdiction around uh, a number of funding programs related to housing, related to public infrastructure, and certainly within the sphere of their regional um, economic development authorities, which actually do work at within their uh, within their sort of super regions. Their sub regions tend to be organized around the metropolitan areas because that's just how things naturally um, get. Uh, uh, sort of ordered in this country when you actually have to do something. Uh, so the federal government's already part way there. There are some interesting things that uh, become possible as service delivery gets delegated to or really devolved to indigenous governments to serve their own populations, potentially boxing out provincial governments um, uh, or ideally in collaboration with them and, and existing service providers. Um, but on an urban reserve that is essentially a kind of uh, 
special jurisdiction or extraterritoriality or, or special economic zone, some very interesting things become possible in the housing space, for example. And I think there's some great experimentation happening there in BC. And I'm very interested to see where that could go. The federal government could lean in there. And frankly, if they get better social outcomes, which improve population health, that might be money better spent than a blank check to the premiers for the health transfer. So th this could get quite interesting if we want to pursue it all the way through. And the federal government uh, has a few cards to play. Finally, um, something like this is going to be iterative. I think it's very important to measure results over time and make sure that we're actually uh, making the changes that, uh, that are necessary as responses to the public policy challenges that are out there, that we review and adjust. Uh, and mostly that somebody sees the initiative. And again, I'll end by noting that the province that gets here first will outperform those stuck playing urban or suburban or rural wedge politics or merely punching down to their local governments. One last slide, just to say it can be done. We didn't get at all the problems of the world solved in the Edmonton metro region but uh, we were able to save uh, 250 quarter sections of land uh, from suburban sprawl and modeled a $5 billion savings on infrastructure over the course of the, the build out of this metropolitan growth plan uh, due to density targets and other measures that uh, uh, promote infrastructure efficiency. Now, unfortunately, things in Edmonton have, um, have I, well, I don't know how to politely say it, have, have, have encountered some challenges, have slowed down a little bit in, in the last while, um, which is very sad to see. But I think the provincial government or mayors or both, ideally, could kick this back into high gear for the benefit of everybody who lives on that map and beyond. So that's the pitch. I look really uh, forward to hearing what Dr. Taylor and Dr. Mills have to say and then to the discussion and questions afterwards. Thank you. Take it away. I was going to go to the podium, but I think I'll just stay here. Why? Because you're stuck? I don't, maybe <laughs> maybe because I'm stuck. I don't know. Um, you know, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to be here. Uh, this, um, you know, what I'm going to talk briefly about today draws on uh, my, my book that, that Karen mentioned and, and also some work that uh, I have uh, done for IMFG. Uh, uh, that, uh, that Enid Slack commissioned on metropolitan governance. You can find all those reports on the IMFG uh, website. Um, you know, I think uh, I wanna start by acknowledging that um, we're in kind of an interesting moment uh, across the country and, and especially in some provinces. Um, provincial governments are involving themselves in local affairs to a degree that's, you know, we haven't seen in probably 25, uh, 30 years. Um, you know, New, New Brunswick is probably not on the radar of anyone in this room, but they have just, uh, the New Brunswick government has unilaterally uh, reorganized local governance across the entire province. They've redrawn all the municipal boundaries. Uh, they have redesigned their regional service delivery bodies, uh, and they've changed the tax and grant formulas that fund local governments and fund these regional bodies. Um, it's probably the most far reaching municipal reform uh, in Canada in. 55 years or, or, or something like that. Uh, as we know, Ontario uh, is reshaping planning and urban development rules and financial arrangements across the whole province. They've taken a special interest, as we know, in, in the powers of big city mayors uh, and, and regional chairs. Um, and perhaps inspired by Ontario, Nova Scotia has taken away key planning powers of Halifax Regional Municipality in a way that's made them not very happy. So we're in an era of provincial unilateralism. So I start with this because, you know, I think in this political environment, it, it's a little hard maybe on the face of it to make a case for a constructive role for provincial governments in, uh, in, in uh, uh, metropolitan and local affairs. But um, uh, nevertheless, I think that Mayor Iverson, oh, I'm not allowed to call you mayor anymore. Uh, Don, you said to call you Don. So Please. I think Don, Don is correct in arguing that we, we don't have to choose between bottom-up regionalism and top-down regionalism. We need both, and they need to be in dialogue uh, with each other. Um, so let's begin by considering what's in it 
for local, provincial, and federal governments? What economic or political interests do each of these levels of government have in promoting metropolitan collaboration or coordination? Um, local governments in metropolitan areas each have their own political and economic interests. Um, and certainly, as in Canada, when local governments rely overwhelmingly on the property tax to fund uh, their activities, they have a very strong incentive to compete for growth that expands the local property tax base. So they don't want to share the fruits of growth. Why would they? They have zero incentive to do so. They do not want to incur losses for their residents, their taxpayers, in the interest of diffuse region-wide benefits. So on their own, even the most enlightened local leaders will choose easy forms of collaboration. Talk is cheap, symbolic actions are cheap, collaboration on user pay services uh, are also appealing if it lowers the cost of providing services for everybody. Um, but no municipality is gonna willingly agree to subsidize the cost of services delivered to taxpayers outside its own boundaries. Why would they do that? So, this is, we, we, there are many, many examples of this across the country. I mean, some years ago in the GTA, there were attempts to pool the cost of social services, uh, go transit, operating costs for city owned performance venues, the zoo, the convention center. Um, and of course, all the non city of Toronto uh, or non metro uh, uh, municipalities were not thrilled with that. Those are things that Metro does. Why should we have to pay into them? We see this in St. John, New Brunswick right now, where, where peripheral uh, towns um, are resisting contributing to capital uh, and operating costs of recreation and cultural facilities that are in St. John, uh, but their residents uh, use all the time, right? They, but they don't want to pay for it. Uh, we see it in Edmonton, as Don said, where a cost-sharing deal to regionalize the transit system uh, seems to have uh, uh, fallen apart just this past week. Um, so, you know, I think that local politicians, business associations, environmentalists, other so so societal groups may appreciate the benefits of regional coordination and burden sharing in a variety of, uh, of domains. They may develop what Don calls a metropolitan mindset, but building durable agreements and arrangements from the bottom up is really hard. It's hard because when it gets down to collisions between the fundamental political and fiscal interests of these local governments uh, and the residents they represent, um, the counter forces arrayed against regionalism are very powerful. So from the, if we switch to thinking about the federal and provincial perspectives, right? You know, we can see how regional collaboration on the planning and financing of heavy infrastructure and regional facilities will save them money. They put a lot of money into these things, right? And they want it to be spent efficiently. So, you know, we often see a lot of lip service to the idea that our big cities are the economic engines of the country and so on. Um, you know, if, if regional coordination on land use and infrastructure planning, the infrastructure projects, investment attraction, environmental management, all of these things is impeding metropolitan economic growth, it hurts the province and the country as a whole. But even with that whole logic, right, if that's accepted by national and provincial politicians, um, it's still not a slam dunk, right? Provincial and national governments certainly have the big picture perspective and the technical knowledge and expertise and the resources to perceive metropolitan areas as the complex and integrated organisms that they are. They are very well positioned to develop a metropolitan mindset from their position at 30,000 feet. But they also face powerful counter pressures. We know that urban areas are underrepresented in provincial legislatures and in the House of Commons. And we know the party competition is increasingly divided on urban rural lines at both the provincial and the federal levels. And also, right, as Don talked about, uh, in Canada, our constitutional division of powers and provinces' jealous protection of their jurisdiction has impeded the creation of the kind of direct federal municipal regulatory and funding relationships that we see in some other countries. And I'm sure Jen will talk about this in the American context. So we can see that the headwinds against regionalism are great, even when the benefits are accepted and may be demonstrable. So what then is the track record in Canada and what lessons can we draw 
uh, from the track record of, of the last 50, 60 years. Well, I argue that most provincial governments were constructive stewards of municipal and metropolitan affairs in the four decades or so after the end of the Second World War. Um, many big moves happened in this time. Canadians have coasted along, for a long time on, on what happened during those years, although the positive impacts have, have faded uh, in, in the last couple of decades. So let's tour some examples across the country. You know, starting in BC, you know, the British Columbia government responded to intergovernmental, intermunicipal conflict in the lower mainland of BC, Greater Vancouver, uh, by creating a regional planning board in 1949. They used a lot of soft power and persuasion to persuade all those municipalities in Greater Vancouver to collaborate on water and sewer infrastructure in the 50s and 60s. They uh, created, uh, ultimately, the region multifunction regional district model that we, we uh, know today that's still, still functioning quite well. Um, if we move to Alberta, right? Alberta established a Royal Commission on Metropolitan Growth in Edmonton and Calgary in the 1940s. This paved the way for the province to stand behind an a policy of incremental annexation as those cities grew. Um, and they also created metropolitan planning boards for both cities and those existed until uh, the late 80s or early 90s, before they were blown up by Ralph Klein. Um, Manitoba restructured Winnipeg's government twice in 1961 and 1971, both times with the intent of creating a democratically accountable metropolitan scale authority to manage rapid urban growth. And then the Ontario story, which I think many of us know well, right? we can, uh, we can see how the province unilaterally broke a deadlock between the city of Toronto which wanted to amalgamate with its hinterland, how times change. City of Toronto used to want to amalgamate uh, and its suburbs, which didn't want to be amalgamated, right? They wanted to stay on their own or have some kind of loose, loose uh, uh, collaboration of some kind. So the province uh, intervened and said, no, we're going to uh, uh, impose a solution. And that was Metro, right? Metro was created in 1954. It was seen to be so successful that it was rolled out in other growing metropolitan areas across Ontario over the next 20 years. Um, Quebec did something quite similar to Ontario. It created regional county municipalities, kind of like our regional municipalities. They created metropolitan communities for Quebec City and Montreal. Um, and finally, New Brunswick again, I guess it's a habit. In 1967, they blew up their county system and created uh, a whole new governance system local governance system across the province uh, in 1967 that existed until uh, uh, 17 days ago when the new system came into effect. So were all these provincial interventions perfect, all these ones from the 1940s through the 1970s? No, of course they weren't perfect. They had many blind spots and certainly many unanticipated consequences. Um, but they worked fairly well for a long time uh, as Canadian provinces and municipalities tried to respond to rapid urbanization and, and, and urban problems by negotiating and renegotiating the uneasy balance between building capacities to achieve a more equitable and efficient urban development at the regional scale on the one hand, and preserving and enhancing local autonomy and democratic accountability on the other. Since the 70s, we've seen much less coherent action on the part of the provinces. And I think there's a few reasons for that. One is, is that in most of the large urbanizing provinces from the 40s to the 80s, you had prolonged periods of single party dominance. They're, they're, you didn't have competitive party systems. So these things weren't really politicized. Um, since then, party politics has become competitive in, in these provinces. Uh, another factor is that politics has become more polarized. Economic growth has slowed and become more uneven and trust in government has declined. So it's harder, it's harder to maintain that, that focus and that attention. For its part, the federal government's attempts to engage in explicit urban policy uh, have a very poor track record. Um, they've generally fallen apart. We saw examples of this in the 70s and the early 2000s. Um, it's certainly accomplished more with what my colleague Neil Bradford uh, calls implicit urban policies, policies that have their effects in cities um, uh, but typically these operate by working through provinces, not with dealing with municipalities. 
directly. And they've generally dealt with particular policy areas like housing, urban indigenous populations and infrastructure. So if we accept that many important problems require region scaled solutions, and yet we can't trust any level of government to consistently recognize its interest in regionalism and develop a metropolitan mindset, what do we do? Like, is there a playbook uh, as, as Don is calling for? I mean, he, what he's calling for is uh, the idea that local demands and local design can be coupled with provincial coaxing and codification, rulemaking, laws, institution building, and so on, and then rewarded by federal incentives. And I think this actually captures, to some degree, what we're already seeing in Canada and the United States and other countries around the world. Um, certainly a local metropolitan mindset or a desire to think regionally can exist uh, even if local interests are not aligned with bringing that about. Um, but provinces can use their powers to support bottom-up local initiative. They can lower the cost of voluntary uh, uh, collaboration with conducive institution building, with rulemaking, with uh, uh, funding arrangements. They can make it easy for local governments to work together. Um, and the federal government can certainly nudge provinces and localities toward a metropolitan mindset with conditional grants and, and other mechanisms. But the main thing is that I don't think we, we, we should expect any given configuration of local, provincial, and federal interests, ideas, and institutions to be permanent. Uh, regionalism cannot be frozen in place, solved, one and done, uh, because the region and its context are always changing. What it looks like and its goals and its outputs are inevitably the subject of negotiation and renegotiation. And so whatever kind of system we create or anticipate requires uh, a, a spirit of constant revisitation if it's gonna work. So with that, I'll pass it over to Jen and uh, look forward to the Q&A. I didn't want to reach across you while you were talking there. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for that. And thanks, Don, for your remarks, too. I'm, there's a lot of really interesting stuff to dig into, and I'm pretty excited for our conversation. I'm going to try and be a little disciplined in my, my contribution to this. Um, but I want to say like a zillion things. So breathe, focus. Um, so I've, I've studied uh, metropolitan and regional uh, organizations and arrangements from a, a bunch of different types uh, in a bunch of different countries in lots of different contexts, um, top down, bottom up, in between, a uh, little bit of both, uh, really, really highly institutionalized, very ad hoc, informal, um, some very, very powerful organizations with lots of teeth and power, um, some very, you know, power, not so powerful um, things. And, and it's, it's really interesting. I don't want to wade here into the debate about which one of these things is best. Um, I don't, I think lots of smarter people than me can, can comment on that. Um, and I'm kind of in agreement with, with Don and, and uh, with Zach about this sort of, maybe there isn't just one way of doing this. Uh, and maybe there isn't just one way for, e for each place uh, to do this. And I'll kind of get to that. But the, the sort of tone of my kind of comments I want to focus on on thinking about okay, given all of the things that I've studied and kind of observed and seen, um, what sorts of lessons can we get about doing regionalism kind of through all of them? That kind of doesn't really matter what kind of institutional environment you're dealing with. Um, that sort of hold tend to hold across uh, across cases, and so and I think in what I'm going to say, we're going to see a lot of parallels and and complementary. Uh, thoughts to what both Don and, and Zach were saying, but also I come at it from a slightly different angle where I'm, I'm thinking about it again, sort of more horizontally in the like cooperation collaboration space uh, uh, and, and then also think a little bit about the multi-level dimension too. So that's, that's kind of where I'm going with that. Um, but before I do, I'm gonna throw a little hand grenade out. Um, I'm gonna be that girl um, and, and say, I don't know who needs to hear this, but re regions and regionalism are not magic. 
Like there's nothing, nothing inevitable about regions. I mean, um, Jane Jacobs has this, this great quote that I like to pull out every once in a while, just to, to throw it in the mix. And I'm gonna read it so I get it right. That a region is an area safely larger than the last one to whose problems we found no solution. Which is <laughs> Jane, so great. Um, she doesn't actually, she's citing somebody else. So we have no idea who actually said that, but um, she describes this, this idea that if we just do it a little bit bigger, um, as escapism from intellectual helplessness. So I, you know, she's got some zingers. Um, and, and I, again, I don't like, obviously I'm a regionalist. I study metropolitan regions. I'm like pro, yay, regions, I'm for it. Um, so I'm not at all being the pessimist <laughs> saying like, we shouldn't do this, um, you know, however we define scales. But I've always really interpreted this and, and always wanted to preface what I say with this uh, as sort of a word of warning that there, you know, the idea that that you do just doing it bigger is gonna, oh, we're good. Like we'll just we'll just do it at the regional scale. I'm <laughs> like, we're fine. Um, I don't think anyone in this room believes that, but like sometimes there's this sort of idea that there's a right scale, there's a right form, there's a, you know, we're talking about these solutions in a very abstract sense. Like we need regionalism. And and I guess my warrant, that's a little bit wishful thinking that we can solve it that way. And we need to think a little bit about institutional design and what actually makes regionalism work um, to get that done. Um, the other thing that is important to keep in mind is that, and Zach sort of alluded to this, although he didn't go quite as far as I'm gonna go, uh, bad policy can happen to good, re <laughs> to good regions. Just because you design, so you have something at the regional scale and like it ought to be you know, get better, at, you've got economies of scale, you've got this, uh, this ability to coordinate that you didn't have before, doesn't mean that's going to happen. Um, you know, these structures don't banish parochialism. They don't guarantee efficient or effective outcomes. Um, and so again, not to be the pessimist here, but I, the, you know, regional solutions are amazing. Institutions can be awesome, but I just want to dispel a little bit of the mythology around this sort of, oh, we'll just, you know, we'll just do regions. I'm like, that's, that'll be awesome. We'll be better. Um, so I guess where I want to go with this and is to say like I, I'm, I'm pro regions, but what again, what, what I really want to zero in on is this idea of like, what does it take to make regionalism work? And obviously in, I don't know, whatever I've got, like five and a half minutes or something, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to drop all of my wisdom uh, on you. And even if I could, I don't think it's you know, going to solve the problem. But um, I want to focus on like the, some nuggets about what I've learned about um, regionalism across across these different types. So, one thing that's important, and you know, Don sort of got there, and and I think Zach was alluding to it too, is that institutional design is important, obviously, in like trying to make these things function and work and be effective. But it can't force cohesion. You know, if you unless you get that buy-in, like nothing's going to happen. So it's important to think about institutions and incentives that will help build consensus. And here, I don't mean consensus in like every decision that's made about regional outcomes. But I mean about the idea of the region, first and foremost. Um, Jay Rickabaugh, who's a colleague of mine, um, makes a really insightful point that regional governance structures are a little bit more like, they're more like international organizations than they are like big city councils, right? Because you're dealing about with trying to balance these competitive and sort of cooperative tensions. Um, obviously, we're not dealing with like sovereignty in these cases, but there's autonomy in the mix. Um, and that's something that needs to be sort of taken into account of. So I think in addition to thinking about, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, but whether a regional structure is going to be able, you know, either should exist and then be able to actually do what it set out to do, which is a, which is a big issue in the United States. We're always talking about having teeth and like being able to do, do the work. Um, it's important to consider what voices are involved in the what part, like in deciding what they do. Um, and to use the language of international organizations, which I think is appropriate here, is thinking about building up the diplomacy of how solutions are devised as well as the power to execute. So really getting that identity, that buy-in, um, that's really important to consensus building. And really important to that is a sort of shared vision, right? really that kind of gets to your metropolitan mindset, but it's really cultivating that in the, in the actors that are involved in doing the regionalism, I think is, is really key. And so um, the metropolitan mindset, like 
set of words to me means that like identity, that vision. Um, and obviously like easier said than done, but once you have that in place, I think it, it's re more resilient to change turnover, like all the things that can kind of derail, as you mentioned, these, these sorts of projects. The second point I wanna make is that coalition building is inevitable. And I think Zach, again, you, you sort of got there too, um, is that you know, carrying through the theme of diplomacy that has internal elements, like trying to decide what we do as a region um, and you know, how, how that happens, but also external dimensions. So one of the key lessons that I learned from the research on the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, if you guys don't know about it, it's a very, very powerful <laughs> regional uh, infrastructure agency in New York. It's not an intermunicipal regional um, authority, but it, it does involve cooperation between two states, which you think would be easy, but uh, is not. Um, Anyway, it's got all the power and authority that you could possibly ever want um, in, in, a, in a regional organization if you're, if you're pro having something that can do stuff. Um, but it turns out it's not autonomous, as autonomous as you think. Oh, spoiler alert, that's like in the book, but now you don't have to read it. So, <laughs> spoiler alert, they're not as autonomous as you think. <laughs> um, and it's not immune to this need for diplomacy. And so for each project that it has, it has to balance the interests of the two states which are sometimes petulant and like annoying, um, but as well as a bunch of the different interests that will be impacted and even sometimes not so impacted by whatever they're trying to do. Um, and that dynamic varies from project to project. There is, it's very dynamic, right? You, one day on one project, you've got this group of people on your side, they're very pro. Uh, the next project, they're very against you. So you can't just like go into a region and do regionalism and be like, we've got a coalition, we're good done. It's a constant process of building coalitions. And like, this is obviously Don's like <laughs> nodding because he's like, yeah, duh, I'm in politics. Like this, this is like what it's like. That's not a surprise, right? Building coalitions around everything is vital to success. But I think sometimes that gets lost in this idea of regionalism, like, okay, we're just going to do this. And, and like, once, once this is up and running, we don't have to, you know, everyone's going to be pro this, but it's, you've got to keep getting people on your side and like building a will. And so again, that having a metropolitan mindset that goes beyond just the people in the room who are like, oh yeah, yeah, we get it. Like this is, this is what, how we do it um, is really valuable. And, and again, in helping to sustain that through. Um, the last thing is that, again, it's a little bit more of a like, I don't know, maybe I'm going off track on here, but like constellations of regionalism are hard to avoid. A lot of times when, so this is related to points about coalition building, about scale, about institutional design, but a lot of times when we're talking about regionalism and making it happen, we're talking about a bit in the abstract, like we're like, okay, we want to create something that doesn't exist, it should be multi-purpose, we, we might have a list, like a wish list of like what we want to happen, but we're not really thinking like, oh, there's going to be a couple of different organizations that might be doing this. And, and I think it's rare that you go into a region where there's like no other game in town. Like no one else is thinking at a regional scale. It might not be at the level of the region that you're thinking, but there, there are all sorts of different definitions of that and all sorts of other, as you mentioned, organizations like, like utilities and transit authorities and all sorts of things that are doing sort of semi-regional things that you need to think about then incorporating and kind of working with if, if you're gonna create something regional. And, and that needs to sort of be baked in. Um, you don't wanna set up a like oppositional kind of situation. And so I think one of the things that's interesting, and I just wanna give these examples because they're fun. Um, when I was studying the uh, regionalism in the United States, we coined the term regional intergovernmental organization. And I'm not gonna get into exactly what that is, but in studying some of these organizations of which there were 477, many of which had been around for like multiple decades. One thing that was really interesting was that they were very changeable and Zach was getting at this too, right? Like they, they had evolved in interesting ways over time and not necessarily to be bigger or more. So some of them, like as they grew, would say, oh, you know, we're gonna absorb this function. We're gonna add this policy competence, this sort of jurisdictional thing. We might take on the regional transit authority and kind of put it under our umbrella. Um, and that, that happens sometimes and oftentimes as these things grew and, and became more legitimate. Um, but 
also the opposite would happen. Sometimes there would be a regional organization that would spin things out where they'd say, you know, and it wasn't like acrimony. It was just saying like, sometimes things work better as standalone things where we can collaborate with you, but you're like basically doing the governance of it and like running it as, as a this or a that. Um, and those things are not mutually exclusive uh, or good or bad, you know, like it's not, a, it's not necessarily a great thing if you've got this thing hoovering up all of the regional things and it's not necessarily a goal to have it shedding functions to become re standalone regional things. But I guess my point here is that that process is very dynamic and is constantly changing and being renegotiated over time. What the region needs is not going to be what you know you did a structure that was designed 30 years ago can kind of handle sometimes um, and so thinking about how how your structures evolve and and adapt and then also collaborate and build coalitions with um, all these other regional actors is really important and i think this is something that's really key to my current sort of thinking about regionalism as the united states is that we we tend to sort of think of like oh there's there's a Rego or there's an MPO or whatever, and like that's all we're going to focus on. But how these things function together to actually get to regional solutions is really super interesting. And, and that fragmentation, some might call it, um, is not, you know, that can be a huge advantage um, or it can be a problem that needs to be solved. So again, it's just to throw that out there that there are, you can recognize possibilities but, and, and be open to collaboration and institutional evolution. So I kind of dumped a lot on you there. I'm going to just summarize by saying, you know, uh, things are not necessarily better if you do them bigger. Um, but you know, the, uh, that's why we need to think about what we mean by regionalism and like what exactly be a little bit more precise about what that actually entails for each place that we're talking about it for. Um, and again, doing regionalism effectively involves this sort of internal and external diplomacy piece that, you know, if you understand that, then all sorts of configurations can be effective. Like you're not necessarily locked into this idea that it's got to be everything to everyone. You can kind of say like, oh man, maybe, maybe we do, we grow from something smaller and go bigger or like leave open the potential for growth and collaboration and we don't have to do everything. Um, and so... That's, that's what I have to say. <laughs> well, fantastic. Thanks so much uh, to our panelists. I, um, we're going to have, I have some questions for you guys. So you're not off the hook yet. And while I'm asking their questions, please in the audience, feel free to generate your own questions. Raise your hand if you have a question um, and our folk will come around with cards that you can write them on. And after we have uh, this initial discussion, then we will open it up to audience Q&A. Um, and same thing for folks online, uh, feel free to put your questions uh, in the chat and we will get to them, hopefully. Um, so I want to start by following up on a point that Jen made about consensus building. And as Jen was talking about, you know, this need to, to, uh, to build consensus, to, to find a way to collaborate. And I started thinking about um, Chris Benner and Manuel Pastor's idea of epistemic communities and that you need a, sh a set of shared values and a shared vision in order for regionalism to take off. And, um, and then I started thinking about Edmonton and you, Don, and you know, what, what it, and I wanna start there, what exactly were those conditions uh, in that moment in time that enabled collaboration to take off in the form of the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board? Well, it was an interesting push-pull um, because my uh, predecessor had put quite a bit of heat on the provincial government uh, in the aftermath of the dissolution of the regional planning commissions, which, uh, as Zach mentioned, had been blown up in the early 90s. So boom times in Alberta, sprawl was, was going nuts, infrastructure costs were going through the roof um, because of cost pressures competing with the oil sands. And it was kind of a perfect storm of unsustainable growth. Um, and so uh, uh, Mayor Mandel 
uh, approached the provincial government around, around this with some of the other mayors in the region who shared the concern, but not all, because many of them were, were, you know, living the dream in the money tunnel with free growth and just, oh, there's another provincial highway. Sure, we'll just add more subdivisions and just make it rain. Um, so it had to be enforced in that case. So it was bottom up with a coalition of business community support, the chambers equivalent to the Board of Trade, others who said this is madness. Um, uh, so it was bottom up, but center city driven initially. Provincial government responds with the creation of the first capital region board and says, uh, you now need to come up with a land use plan and puts 24 municipalities, 25 initially at the table, um, though one of them didn't exist by the end of the process because uh, it dissolved. Um, other sustainability, smaller sustainability issues. But anyway, um, being around the table itself, even being forced to do something that a lot of them didn't want to do, created some literacy in these issues um, and some trust and, and also some healthy tension that was at least drawing the issues to the surface. And so I ended up as a city councillor involved with a bunch of the regional transit work and planning work and um, some of the committees, and I loved it. <laughs> I, the, the comparison to you know, international organizations is apt because I was more into model UN than model parliament, I guess, which is why I loved this environment. And when I became mayor, um, one of the first things that I did to try to uh, sort of pick up on that momentum besides having run with a very strong mandate to, to, to go in this direction, which was very attractive to the business community, which otherwise was terrified of my progressive agenda, but at least I was gonna do the right thing on the region, uh, notwithstanding all the bike lanes that were coming their way. Um, and so we, uh, I did what, what I called Camry diplomacy. You know, We got in a Toyota and we went to see every mayor and, and um, on their terms, visited them in their communities, didn't make everyone come down in the city and basic diplomacy, right? Um, but then also I prioritized about 30% of my time and energy as mayor into this regional work because it was such a critical time. And uh, through it all, we were able to um, produce a, a blue ribbon panel report. Uh, uh, again, things started to stall with the 24. So a subset got together that had this idea that eventually became, you know, what I call the metropolitan mindset, but it was that shared meaning of five and then nine and then 13 that became basically the coalition of the willing. Um, uh, and then we convinced the provincial government to change the design of the institution uh, to have those 13 and tweak some things around the mandate. Um, and then that became the ultimate incarnation of the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Board. Now, here's a mistake I made, and others made mistakes that contribute to this, so I'm not going to wear all of it. But I, in my second term, I said, I'm only going to put 20% of the time into this because I think it's well on its way. And I probably needed to spend at least the same 30 because uh, there was turnover uh, in some of the counties and so there were, uh, and some of the cities and towns, but chiefly some of the counties. And then when the provincial government changed from the New Democrats, which were just like the previous progressive conservatives, quite supportive of this approach, uh, the urban rural wedge politics started to come into it and the counties thought, ah, we don't actually have to do this. And so for a period of time, they were trying to convince, they went off, met with separately with the provincial government said, you can let us out of all of the cost sharing obligations, the land use constraints. This is all just red tape, right? And you wanna get rid of red tape. Um, and that, that was, a deep wound to the trust around the table. Um, and I'm not sure diplomacy would have fixed that. It was it was opportunistic, but I understand why, given the signals from the Kenny government and, and the minister at the time, why, why that was an attractive strategy. But um, but yeah, there is a constant need to create, recreate, and it's it's very, very trust-based. Um, and I think the other thing is that we we didn't continue to bring the business community and all the folks who had been passionate about it and put the political pressure on in the first place. We had to keep all of those stakeholder groups engaged. If I had it to do over again, you know, the grand diplomacy would have would have carried on at a much higher pace in my second term. So if what Don described, was that a unique moment or are there are there not at elements all. that are replicable and yeah I, I mean one thing i wrote about in in my book on the basis of my research in in greater vancouver 
there was a version of the Camry diplomacy in, in, in two great moments in, in the Lower Mainland uh, in the 1960s and again in the 1980s. The 1960s, the big debate was about creating a regional land use plan and then making it actually enforceable, working it, having those policies be agreed to in a way that the local governments would, would implement them voluntarily. Um, and uh, what made that happen is that local politicians who believed in it uh, and also the local public servants got in their cars and drove around the region and, and made the sales pitch. And it was very important that the big city Vancouver people get out of Vancouver and show the due deference and respect, right? All of this happened again in the 1980s where a, a right-wing provincial government abolished regional planning and uh, the regional district quietly started to do voluntary regional planning. Gordon Campbell, who ended up becoming premier of the province when he was mayor of Vancouver, he did Camry diplomacy. He, uh, he was looked at with great suspicion by all of the other municipalities, um, but he, he uh, spent a year spending two days a week driving around selling it. And ultimately they agreed on a plan that, that where everybody had to give away something in order to get something. And they convinced uh, the provincial government of the day to enshrine this in legislation. So I think this is, we can learn from this, right? That that, that matters. Yeah, definitely. Where do I look to look at Don? I'm just like gonna look down here at you. I don't know if you see me looking. He's inside this box. He's in the, he's you're in wondering. the box. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I think the point that resonates the most with me here, I mean, that's that's awesome. And I can like pick up on that a little bit too, this sort of camera diplomacy element of it. But like the the bit that you're you were talking about about the business community and keeping that, like this is the metropolitan mindset is not a political fit. Like it is political, but it's not purely political. And the way to make things resilient is to make sure that like pe people is the wrong word, but like the like the communities and stakeholders that are involved in and have an interest in regionalism. Are are you know supportive of of that and and a lot of times so David Wolf who's over there I'm gonna make you stand up but <laughs> we worked on a concept called civic capital where which was basically this idea that there's a sometimes there's like a shared vision of what the region is and why it matters and that often comes from the business community or other parts uh, that are not political who see the benefit of thinking regionally or are kind of like pissed off that they have to deal with. A fragmented political structure and say like you know what get it together get it together like we just need like we, let's do this and that sort of ground base of support is gives a little bit more legitimacy to this effort that you know that more enlightened politicians are you know trying to get through to to cooperate with one another and so um, when I think about your sort of metropolitan mindset and how you cultivate that, it's not just internal, it's not just in the provinces and the federal government and in the, among the groups of people who are actually doing it, but it's going out to the, to the world <laughs> to say, this is what we're doing, this is why it matters, this is why you should care, and have that being kind of echoed back to you too, so that the people in the room are like, oh yeah, yeah, they, like they get it too, they're behind us, like this is, this is a collective effort right, in the biggest sense. Um, the other element, I mean, about the sort of Camry di diplomacy is that all the, rego the regional and governmental organizations that I've seen and organizations that were really successful at this, um, the organization itself, like the governance organization, isn't the star ever. Um, it's the people who make it up that are. So this idea that like you went to them they to the to the other mayors or chairs or whoever is involved, um, so that you know you say say that like you're not just going to govern from the middle, but like there's this element too that whenever there are wins, it's not like the regional, it's not me as the like leader of this regional government who won this. It's like us collectively, and you go back to your community and say, I own this, man. Like I was, I was part of this. We're getting this benefit as a community, and like we are winning from it. And so this idea of kind of not not being the, almost the like if <laughs> I'm kind of contradicting myself here, but like you want to celebrate what the region's accomplished, but not make it the star of, mm -hmm. of that. And I think that's what helps to build this sort of goodwill around it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add, oh, you wanted to jump in. <laughs> well, I, I mean, whenever you look at these stories, no matter where you go, if you 
peel back the lid of these stories. It's not about the institutions. It's about policy entrepreneurs, yeah. right? It's mm -hmm. about champions. Could be a politician like Gordon Campbell was uh, in 1987, 88 Vancouver, or Don was, uh, or it, it can be a, a, a member of the, the business community. It could be like in, in Winnipeg, there's this sort of voluntary organization that is sort of mutating into something else that's run by this woman named Colleen, whose last name I can't remember. <laughs> Don, do you remember her last name? You've probably met her. Uh, and she is just beating the drum, every possible opportunity. And through her force of will, they have created a joint procurement institution. Uh, you know, it's, it's always comes down to people. Yeah. Um, so following on, um, on, on this discussion, it, there's actually considerable disagreement among the three of you. And I just want to tease that out a little bit. Um, so, you know, so I love this image of the constellations of regionalism. Um, but I, I'm wondering what is the role for the federal and the provincial government in, in enabling those constellations to come to light? Um, and it, whoever wants to jump in here. Uh, can. I mean, I, <laughs> um, I guess my point is that the constellations are kind of there already. Like in some places, they're already there. I mean, especially in the United States. So, like you and you and I know a bunch of about this, where where it's like there is a tendency to have more um, single purpose type regional organizations than there are here. But they exist in Canada too, in the sense where there are actors functioning across jurisdictional boundaries that you kind of have to grapple with. There are also actors like the province, I guess, who are also dealing in regionalism, even if they're not themselves regional entities. So like they're making policy at the regional scale. And so those, those constellations exist already. Um, so I don't know it's, it, that it's something that needs to be created. My, my point there is that if you want to, to say, okay, we're gonna put something new in the mix in order to do this better, you don't like you can elbow things out of the way. You can make, you can design the institutions so that they absorb what's happening, you can design them as separate. Um, but that there's kind of no way unless you're creating some sort of like, really like a regional government that's going to you know, take in all of these functions um, to avoid the fact that there are going to be other players in the in the regional game. And, and my point here is that like, again, when we talk about regionalism and sort of starting from scratch, we talk about starting from scratch, but it's never really from scratch. We There's always like, something out there already, um, you know, even in, in the greater Toronto area, we have um, and a shout out to Gabe in the back there. <laughs> yes, you, <laughs> who there's a, there's an informal mayors and chairs, a group that it was created, you know, during COVID and it's, you know, it's very informal, um, but you know, that it's there. There's a similar kind of related um, group of city managers that talks all the time, right? This is stuff that like, maybe people don't know exists, maybe they do, right? But, um, you know, even here we have these sort of mechanisms that exist. And so I, I guess the, it, to get back to your question, like what's the role of the province and the federal government in, in sort of doing that? Uh, I think it's in being the sort of stick in some ways and like trying to stimulate the creation of a multifunctional, um, you know, regional entity to think really carefully about institutional design, think really carefully about what's already there and try and make it so that, so that when, when these things are, are sort of enabled, they are empowered to be collaborative or if they're stepping on toes, they know they're doing it and why. Any, anything to add to that, Don? Yeah, well, I, I I have the benefit because I'm virtual of seeing the questions that are coming in, which are fantastic. And, <laughs> and I'm going to keep this short, um, but there are a number of public servants. Uh, so I think it's important to make a distinction between the federal and provincial public services and the political side. I think public servants have an opportunity to help build the case for this in non-political and administrative, like in policy terms. Why is it in the interest not of uh, Doug Ford, but of Ontarians to think in this terms, for example. So I think that can be a part of the connective tissue on the, on the uh, public service side of things. But I, I do think that both at the provincial uh, and federal level, 
um, you know, finding a way to re like we're just experimenting with how to frame this in a way that will be compelling and resilient to political change too. Because especially where we're down to polarization, as as Zach mentioned, if one government went this direction and then the government changes, then it's almost automatic that you know that that charter power is going to be repealed or that planning authority is going to be repealed and you can't actually plan or deliver services or do anything coherently much less efficient efficiently in that environment so public service that gently reminds its political masters of that would be super helpful speaking as a former mayor and i know that they do that um because we talk to them too informally right um but building that mindset among the, the those experts would be helpful but then finding the argument uh and and i think the unlock point really comes with um convincing uh uh particularly conservative governments uh that this is in their interest uh that vilifying the cities and and people who live in them who are an increasing number of the of the country, maybe you can get away with that in American politics through gerrymandering, but like the eventually that eats itself for breakfast. Like it's not a sustainable strategy to rejuvenate a base, to engage young people, to engage a diversified group of voters. And so like, I mean, that's that's a basic political challenge with, with the approach, but I know, I know very thoughtful conservatives, including like extremely right-wing people who manage a lot of cognitive dissonance around this issue because they know that our cities are our economic engines, but aren't quite ready to say that in a way that, because it immediately follows that you have to address all of these issues and um, in a thoughtful way, as opposed to just blaming the mayor or the city council for all of the challenges of inner city life, which are in fact a cascading policy failure of federal and provincial jurisdiction around supports for vulnerable people. It's it's as long as it's as long as the and and I guess it fall, <laughs> falls to Canadians ultimately to decide do we want to reward that politics by voting for people who are going to play the politics of grievance and division and blame or are we going to reward policy entrepreneurs in leadership with a mandate to go fix this stuff and make it better. So, uh, you know, I think progressives generally make some version of here's how things can be better i would like to hear a conservative leader somewhere make that case um the last time i heard it around here was ed stelmack who created the capital region board um and so i i think i i think the the right owes this some attention if if for no other reason than within their economic frame, it is negligent not to address these issues. So I'm gonna to go to a couple of questions from the room. Um, so we actually had a, a, a few questions about uh, the regional transit uh, in Edmonton and the collapse, recent collapse of that. And I just wanna uh, <laughs> warn you also or, or encourage you because I hear that Infrastructure Canada is online and wants to know what the feds can do to support uh, generally regionalism. So it's a twofer. Sure, well, uh, I'm, I'm gonna channel um, Mike Bloomberg who I got to hear um, address a room full of mayors from around the world who said, um, I'm, I'm not going to ever say anything bad about my predecessor or my successor. And so um, I'm not going to put this on it on any one mayor um, uh, or get into the politics of it. But but I do think that um, an interesting choice was made and, and, and Jen got at this, which is that um, there was a fork in the road uh, between a voluntary association into a commission or um, a mandated regional service delivery through the statutorily created uh, metropolitan board. And um, in good faith, the, the parties decided to do a commission structure, which was a spin out from the metropolitan board to keep the board focused on land use. That was seemed like a good idea at the time, but very critically, um, one had the ability to compel and requisition funds and the other was voluntary association. Um, we went down that road for several years and then uh, one of the counties and the second largest transit operator after Edmonton decided not to join the commission. And in, in retrospect, that might have been fatal at least to the momentum of it, if not the operating premise. 
but and this is partly to answer um, uh, the the inquiry from uh, the the feds is when as soon as the commission collapsed it became uh, an obligatory mandate again of the regional board. So it's now back in front of an authority that um, has a requisitioning power and can direct how services, it hasn't used those powers that coercively, um, but there is now a stick in the conversation again, rather than all the, you know, the carrots, we're gonna work together kind of, uh, uh, let's all hold hands uh, version of the transit commission, which, which didn't work out. Um, so there's a lot of learnings from that, but I think, you know, there is, there is, um, there is an after, there is a 2.0 and maybe a 3.0 before you get there. But the other, the other thing I would say is that we all assumed we couldn't get to the full integration of all nine of the transit systems at once, because one, that would be very complex to actually merge. And two, you've got the sticky question of the debt related to the rapid transit versus just, you know, buses and garages, which everybody else understands. Um, maybe we weren't thinking big enough. Maybe we should have, you know, either asked or forced the question of putting all of it together in the first place, because Edmontonians have been building uh, at, at uh, you know, significant uh, property tax expense, the backbone of a regional transit network that is primarily light rail, um, uh, all, all on our expense on 70% of the tax base. And yet in some of our park and rides, um, 30 or 40 or 50% of the, depending on how close it is to the edge of town of the license plates are from outside the city. So, you know, there are some deeper equity issues and maybe we didn't push hard enough. Maybe the tendency for diplomacy and consensus building and keeping it all moving prevented us from just, you know, dealing with the, the elephant in the room and, and maybe uh, a mandate to do that um, is necessary. Now, I, I wouldn't rock that boat before this provincial election, free political advice to everyone out there, let the dust settle on this. Um, <laughs> um, but I mean, it's stupid to have nine transit systems. It's just stupid to have nine transit systems for 1.5 million people. So, um, so that cannot hold, uh, and and it will be revisited. And I will be very interested to see what happens as a transit user. And, and a quick, um, quick follow up for you guys um, from the room. Also, are there any incentive carrots from the U.S. experience that could could help in this vein? I mean, I. The one example for transit governance that, that I think that English Canadians should look at is what's going on in Montreal. And English Canadians never look at it because nobody ever writes about it in English. Um, but it is uh, probably the most sophisticated example of how you manage uh, a funding relationship and a policy coordination relationship across uh, about two dozen municipalities, I believe, in its current, I think there's five transit operators right now down from like 12 or something a few years ago, there were some regional mergers uh, and it's politicians, local politicians who, who sit on those boards with provincial involvement. So I think we could have a whole event, maybe we should have a whole event on transit governance. In terms of the, the American experience with, with federal, federal funding, <laughs> um, uh, you know, in, in, in the United States, going back to the 1950s with the, 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 the Federal Housing Acts and so on, and then, and then that was followed by uh, transportation uh, rules, what, what the federal government wanted to do was force metropolitan areas to, to coordinate regionally when it came to spending federal money. Right, the money is going to flow down to build roads and transit systems and so on. They wanted to make sure there was some kind of regional coordination. So what they did is they say, you create a regional transit body, an organization, a metropolitan planning organization, an MPO, and it will review uh, the uh, requests for funding that come up from municipalities and, and other entities, operators, and so on. Now, that made sense in principle. The idea was is that would compel some kind of coordination. What happened in practice in many, many places is that these, these MPOs were so institutionally weak that they couldn't say no to anything. And, and you, you find this experience across the United States. So the promise of that is, is, uh, is a bit uncertain. Now, would you want bureaucrats in Ottawa evaluating all of these things? 
you know, if we had something like that in Canada, would they have the sensitivity and the ground level view in order to be able to decide whether a project was good or bad? I don't know what's worse, to be honest with you. Jen, what do you think? Oh God, yeah, I think we need a whole session on that because so many, so many things to pick up. Um, I, I think the, the MBO situation is really interesting. Um, and, and one thing that I've always meant to do and I haven't done, and here like free thesis topic for anyone who wants one, <laughs> is regional intergovernmental organizations in the United States are not MPOs, right? Like they're separate things. They're like councils of governments or economic development districts. But sometimes, as I alluded, and the MPO has been folded in to those organizations. And when that happens, you get a really interesting, you could potentially get a really interesting dynamic, which I actually haven't been able to study rigorously, but you, there you have the MPO where you're now thinking about how everything aligns, not just with transit coordination and making sure your bridges go to, to roads on the other side of the river, and, you know, that it's all sensible and makes sense from a, from a regional flow perspective, but you're starting to link it up to sort of synergistically with other topics and other policy areas, um, such as housing, such as environmental protection, such as go on and so on and so forth, air quality. Um, so that I think is a really interesting question is like what if, if you have this MPO function very separate um, and sort of standalone-ish, and again, we're talking about a, an approval system, not a operating kind of entity, um, what, you know, what does that mean? And, and the, I, the other thing I would say is I wish I had insights on this because I, like I live in New York, the New York metropolitan area. And it's, I mean, it's so, it's so complicated. <laughs> it's so complicated. It's very, I mean, just, I don't want to use the word dysfunctional necessarily, but you know, transit oh. is the MTA is not like the thing that I would say is like, oh, we nailed it. <laughs> I mean, two, two of the examples of this, which probably have the big, some of the biggest budgets in the United States, right. Are, Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, <laughs> Metropolitan Council, and, uh, and, and what we have in Atlanta, right? These are yeah, enormous right. systems where you have the, the representation of the municipalities uh, indirectly in, in some way, uh, more or less directly tied to land use transportation, all these things mm -hmm. potentially reaching across uh, uh, these, these policy boundaries. And uh, they, they still can't say no and make bad decisions. That's true. So <laughs> I'm told we're at time. Um, thank you very much. Let's have uh, Enid Slack wrap us up. Thanks very much. I'm, I, I've been um, brought up to end this really interesting conversation. Um, my name is Enid Slack and I'm the director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the School of Cities here at U of T. And uh, we as IMFG are delighted to be co-sponsoring this event uh, with the School of Cities today. Um, that was a really interesting discussion. I took lots of notes and, and I'm sure some of you did too. I, I really liked Don's idea of a, a metropolitan mindset. I, I think that's a great, a great term. I've never heard it before, uh, which really talks about identity and vision that involves a whole lot of people. It's not just the politicians or the bureaucrats, it's the business community, it's the public, it's everybody. I, I um, and of course, when asked if it's a top down or a bottom-up uh, regionalism, it, it's got to be some of each. Obviously, bottom-up is a voluntary cooperation, uh, but as a lot of the speakers said, when the rubber hits the road, nobody wants to pay for somebody else's services, so you know you need other, other top-down mechanisms as well. So there's a role for local governments, but there's also a role for provincial governments bringing in legislation, and, and we talked about a role for the federal government in nudging some of uh, these uh, regional uh, bodies. Um, I, I think I like the idea of having a champion or a policy entrepreneur, um, because that's that's what makes these things go. People like the former mayor of Edmonton, Don Iveson, um, and, and uh, with the Camry diplomacy, that's a new term for me. Um, but, the, but the other thing that, of course, was said is it's a constant revisiting of the regional uh, of regionalism. You create something, but that's not going to last for everything, for, forever. And we've certainly seen that in our region where we've kept changing. So as we are revisiting regionalism, we will hold more events, won't we, Karen, on, yep. Yep. Keep <laughs> on, it going. on, on uh, making the case for regionalism. So um, I would like to, to thank um, our staff at IMFG, the staff at the School of Cities, everyone at the Monk School, 
uh, for helping organize this event today and making it run smoothly. Uh, but I would especially like to thank Don coming in from Edmonton. And frankly, Don, we're glad you stayed in Edmonton if you're not feeling well. <laughs> uh, but it's good to see you on Zoom. Um, thanks to uh, Jen and Zach, and especially to Karen for steering us through this afternoon. Uh, today's event has been recorded and will be available on our website at IMFG and also the School of Cities website uh, in, in the next uh, few days. Uh, so please share it with anybody uh, you think might be interested in it who couldn't attend today. So thank you for those of you who are online and thank you for those of you who are here in person. Uh, thanks for coming and please enjoy the rest of your evening.